this video, we're going to discuss the calculation of a square matrix called a determinant. A determinant is a numerical value calculated for a square matrix, and it involves summing products in which all the factors in each product are in different rows and different columns. So for example, if I have a two by two, a and D are both in different rows and they are in different columns. B and C are in different rows and different columns. There's also a pattern to whether or not a product could, should be considered positive or negative. For a two by two matrix, the product AD on the main diagonal will be considered positive and the product BC on the other diagonal will be considered negative. You then add all of these products, including whether or not they should have been multiplied by negative one. So for a two by two, the determinant is calculated by taking the main diagonal A times D plus negative one times B times C, or other, in other words, A times D minus B times C is the determinant of any two by two. Now for a three by three, there are six possible products, not just two. If I take the A in the first row and first column and I pair it up with that lower right hand two by two, A, E, and I is a product that contains different values in different rows and different columns. A, F, H also contains factors in different rows and different columns. B, D, I contains factors in different rows and different columns, B, F, G, C, D, H, and C, E, G. Those are the six possible products that can be calculated by taking values in different rows and different columns. And again, some of the products are multiplied by negative one, some are not and there is a definitional pattern to whether or not a product should be considered positive or negative. I'll point that out a little bit later in the slides. Um, so anyway, for this three by three, you would calculate its determinant by finding those six products and adding them, including whether or not the product should be multiplied by negative one. Now, the larger your square matrix, the more complicated it becomes finding all of the products and determining the positiveness and negativeness. For example, if you have a four by four, there are 24 sets of products that you would have to find if you were you know, searching for all possible products in which the factors come from different rows and different columns. So for example, with a four by four, you could start in the upper left-hand first row, first column with that number four. You're then connecting the four to the lower right-hand matrix that's a, like a three by three matrix within the four by four matrix because all of those values are in different rows and different columns. And so you're gonna create products with that first four among those values. If you then move to the eight, again, leave out the row and column that contains the eight and you're working off of the remaining values. If you move on to the five, eliminate the row and column that the five is in, you're gonna work with the remaining values and so forth, You know, with zero being the last number in that first row, you're gonna pair it up with the values that are in the lower left three by three. And I've kind of outlined here that the determinant of that four by four matrix then is four times the determinant of the three by three that is created by leaving out the row and column that contain the four. And then we're subtracting, remember there's a pattern with positives and negatives, eight times the determinant of the three by three that's created by leaving out the row and column that contain the eight. And then I add five times the determinant of the three by three that is left when I leave out the row and column that contain the five. And then minus zero times the determinant of 
the remaining rows and columns when I leave out the row and column that contain the zero. Now I know zero times anything is zero, so you know that's going to make that whole calculation clean up. But anyway, if somebody found all 24 of the products possible with factors that are in different rows and different columns for this particular 4 by 4 matrix, and you combine the correct negatives and positives, you would end up with the value 362. So the determinant of this 4 by 4 matrix is 362. Again, it's the sum of all products possible in which the factors are in different rows and different columns, and then there's a pattern of whether or not a product should be considered positive or negative. You then add all of those results, and in this case, it gave us 362. Now, a textbook is going to define a determinant as we have written it out on this slide. Uh, like with, you know, many different mathematical ideas, sometimes when you actually try to put it in words, it becomes much more complicated sounding than if you were having somebody demonstrate what's actually going on. But the textbook definition of a determinant is that it is a unique number defined for a square matrix. Again, you only find determinants for square matrices. If a matrix is not square, there is no definition for the determinant. It's a calculation that can be organized in many ways, but the definition is that it's the summation of negative 1 to the k times a1 j sub 1 times a2 j sub 2 times a3 j sub 3, etc. Um, what the A with the subscripts is representing are the different positions. And again, you're creating all products in which the factors are in different rows and different columns. And the K is the number or count of times that a subscript on the position is to the left of a smaller subscript. So what's meant by that subscript comment is that for example, if you had a 4x4, four four, one such term, so one such product in the 24 different possible products would be the position A13 multiplied by the position A22 multiplied by the position A34 multiplied by the position A41. And the negative 1 is raised to the fourth power because there are four times in which a subscript is to the left of a smaller subscript. So A13 is being multiplied by A22. 3 is to the left of the smaller subscript of 2. And then we have A13 times A41. 3 is to the left of the smaller subscript of 1. A22 is multiplying A41, and 2 is to the left of the smaller subscript 1. And lastly, A34 multiplied by A41, 4 is to the left of the position 1. So there are four different counts of a subscript being to the left of a smaller subscript. So the exponent on that particular term would be 4, so that particular term would not be multiplied by negative 1, it would be positive. I know all of that sounds very confusing. Um, there's kind of no simple way to put it all in words. <laughs> Instead, um, it's kind of better to have some demonstrated for you, and we also are going to use our calculators or Desmos um, to calculate determinants. For the most part, we're not going to be doing them by hand, but again, as a linear algebra student, you want to at least have some understanding of what was going on when your calculator or Desmos did all that number crunching for you. I know that definition of whether terms should be positive or negative is confusing and convoluted, um, but it is the definition. I can't change it. It is the actual definition. 
but there is a visual pattern that is much easier to recognize for any size matrix. You can create a checkerboard grid of positives and negatives, starting with a positive in the upper left-hand corner. If I have a two by two, notice A is in the upper left-hand corner, so it would be considered positive. And one of my products is A times D, the other product is B times C. B is in the second column, it's considered negative. So I have positive A times D, negative B times C. For an overall determinant, A times D minus B times C. If I have a three by three, then pick a row or column and then follow the positives and negatives of that row and column. And when you pick a specific value, you then leave out the rest of the values and it's row and column, and you're left with a matrix that is one dimension lower. So with the three by three, if I pick A, I then eliminate the first row, first column. I'm left with the two by two E, F, H, I. So my first product is A, E, I, because what I do is I calculate the determinant of E, F, H, I. So EFHI's determinant would be E times I minus F times H, and I multiply that by positive A, positive because A is in the position that should be positive. So AEI minus AFH are the first two products in the calculation of this three by three determinant. Then I move on to the B. B is in a negative position in the first row. I eliminate its row and column. I'm left with the two by two DFGI. The determinant of DFGI would be DI minus FG. So negative B times DI is the third product. And then negative B times negative FG is the fourth product in the overall calculation. So again, the first four products are AEI minus AFH minus BDI plus BFG because the two negatives cancel. Then moving on to the C, C is in a positive position. The two by two that goes with it is DEGH. DEGH's determinant will be D times H minus E times G. So multiply that determinant by C and I get positive C, D, H minus C, G, E, or C, E, G, whichever order. <laughs> um, so anyway, again, there are six possible products for a three by three, and there is a notable pattern to the positives or negatives um, if you, you know, follow the grid like we have outlined on this slide. Let us talk through this again with a three by three matrix that has some numerical values in it. So I'm going to go across the first row. So again, the pattern of positive and negative is positive, negative, positive. So negative one is in the first position. So I take it as its face value, negative one. And I pair it with the two by two that's left when I remove the first row and first column. I find the determinant of that two by two. So six times five minus three times seven. It gets multiplied by negative one. Then that creates my first two products in the overall six product calculation. Move on to the second position in the second column of the first row. I have one, it's, it's in a negative position. Remember the checkerboard grid of positive, negative, positive. So one gets paired with the two by two, zero, three, four, five. I find the determinant of zero, three, four, five, zero times five minus three times four. It gets multiplied by one, but also it is considered negative because of the negative position. Then I move on to two, Two is back to being positive because it was positive, negative, positive. Two gets paired with the two by two, zero, six, four, seven. 
I find the determinant of 0, 6, 4, 7, 0 times 7 minus 6 times 4, and that gets multiplied by positive 2. And if I go through that calculation, I get negative 45. Negative 45 is the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix. So again, notice the pattern. If you learn how to find the determinant of a 2 by 2, you find the determinant of a 3 by 3 by going across a row or a column, paying attention to the positive negative checkerboard grid, and you multiply those values by the determinant of the remaining values. Usually you will see people go across the first row, um, but if you do go across a different row or column paying attention to the checkerboard grid of positives and negatives, you will end up also getting negative 45. So again, if, if you look carefully at the pattern, it is fitting that complicated definition, but there is some, you know, kind of recognizable logic to what you are doing, and it makes it, you know, much more easy to crunch through than following through what the actual definition was saying. So if you really wanted to, you could pause the screen here and, you know, look at all the subscripts at the bottom of the slide and pair it up with the calculations that we did and you would see that we obtained every one of the calculations in the definition that's at the bottom of the slide and obtained our determinant of 40 negative 45 but by grouping it like we did it's much easier to see you know what to do if you kind of group it like we did versus trying to follow through the definition as it's written at the bottom of the screen. For three by threes, there's a clever little trick that you could do. You could write down your matrix and then you could write the first two columns again. Okay, so notice I've repeated the first column and the second column. Then I make diagonals from the upper left to the lower right and then I make other diagonals from the upper right to the lower left. The ones that are in the main diagonal direction, upper left to lower right, I consider those positive. And then the ones from the upper right to the lower left, I consider them negative. So I have them marked here on the slide. The red ones are positive, the blue ones are negative. And then you make all of those calculations, but the diagonals that are positive, you leave the sign that they are. The diagonals that are denoted negative, you make them the opposite. So one, negative 1 times 6 times 5, you leave it alone. And then you add to it 1 times 3 times 4. And then you add to it 2 times 0 times 7. And then you're going to add negative 1 times four times six times two plus negative one times negative one three times seven plus negative one times one times zero times five and if you know you see you still get the negative 45. That little trick works for three by three so again some people like doing that little trick um, you know it kind of just depends on what visuals you prefer um, but like I said in the long run we'll be running programs on our calculator or Desmos if you go into matrix mode and you go to math, determinant is the very first program in the list of programs. So it's right there and handy for you to hit determinant and then you go into matrix and leave it on names and tell it which matrix you want to use. Um, if you're working on your computer, Desmos you know, has determinant as one of its calculations. But again, as a linear algebra student, um, you do want to know some of the background theory to what your calculator is number crunching for you. Now again, the larger your matrix, the more involved the calculation becomes. If you have a four by four, there's going to be a total of 24 products that you would have to find. You could still find them by using that general procedure that we showed with the three by three, 
where you go across a row or down a column. And once you pick a value, when you eliminate its row and column, you're left with a matrix that is one dimension lower. So with the four, you're left with the three by three that's boxed. With the eight, you're left with the three by three that's boxed. With the five, you're left with the three by three that's boxed. And with the zero, you're left with the three by three that's boxed. So if you're calculating the determinant of a four by four, you again, pick a number, in this case, the four, and then you calculate the determinant of the remaining three by three. Well, you calculate the determinant of the remaining three by three by going across one of its rows or down one of its columns. And I have the calculation for this one outlined here, and we get 362 as the final determinant value. Again, notice the calculation involving the four, it was positive four times that determinant, but then the calculation involving the eight, it's minus one times eight because of the positive, negative, positive pattern. Um, the five is considered positive, so positive five times the determinant of the remaining. And then I know zero times anything is just zero, but you would consider that term negative because of the positive, negative, positive, negative um, ordering across that row. This method of taking a number and then creating the determinant of the remaining values is called the method of cofactors. So we saw an example of the method of cofactors with a three by three. This is an example of the method of cofactors with a four by four. Um, if you had a five by five, you could do the same thing. It's just, you would have a number times the determinant of a four by four, but the determinant of that four by four would be values times determinants of three by threes, um, et cetera. And again, with a five by five matrix, there's going to be a lot more products. In fact, there's going to be 120 products in a five by five. Understanding how many products go into the determinant calculation can be useful. It's related to the size of the matrix. And the quick you know, thing to point out is the number of products is the size of the matrix factorial. So for a two by two, the number of products was two. Two factorial is two. If you have a three by three, there were six products. Three factorial is six. If you have a four by four, there are 24 products. Four factorial is 24. If you have a five by five, there's 120 different products. If you were gonna actually find the determinant by hand, you'd have to find 120 different products. Five factorial is 120. A six by six is going to have 720 products. That's what six factorial is and seven by seven matrix. There's gonna be 5,040 different products. So um, luckily I'm not gonna ask you to calculate the determinant of a seven by seven by hand. <laughs> um, and 5,040 is seven factorial. The reason why the factorial notation gives us our result is factorial notation is really a combinatorics notation and you're counting how many different combination of items you can create. So when you pick a value, you then have one less number of rows and columns you can pick from. And then once you pick the next value, you again have one less row and column you can pick from, etc. So that's why the count of products turns out to be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, etc. So with a 4 by 4, there are originally four different numbers I could pick in a row. But then once I pick it, there's only three numbers I can pick in a row. Once I pick that, now there's only two numbers I can pick in the row. And then once I pick the third number, there's only one number left. So four times three times two times one, 
gives us the total number of products possible with a 4 by 4 if all the factors are in different rows and different columns. We have some helpful rules about determinants related to the elementary row operations. Swapping two rows was one of my elementary row operations. If I swap any two rows, the determinant will be the opposite of what it was. So the determinant we looked at earlier was negative 45. If I swap two rows, I will get a determinant of positive 45. Another elementary row operation was to multiply by a scalar, a non-zero scalar. So notice I took my matrix where I've, sw I've swapped the rows, so the determinant's now 45, but I multiplied the bottom row by three. Instead of four, seven, five, I have 12, 21, 15. So the new determinant will be three times 45 or 135. So again, multiplying one row by a scalar gives you a determinant that is that scalar times the original determinant of the matrix before you multiplied by the scalar. Another elementary row operation is to exchange a row with the sum of that row and a scalar multiple of another row. And surprisingly, you do not change the value of the determinant. If you trace through the algebra, you see that you get the same calculation as the original matrix. So for example, if I replaced row three with four times row one added to row three, negative one times four added to four will be zero, one times four added to seven is 11, two times four added to five is 13, and the determinant of that new matrix is still negative 45. So again, replacing a row with the sum of it and the scalar multiple of another row actually does not change the value of the determinant. One last rule related to the elementary row operations to point out is if I multiply the entire matrix by a scalar, the new determinant is that scalar raised to the n power times the original determinant. n is the size of the matrix. So if I have a three by three and I multiply the whole matrix by three, the new determinant will be three cubed times negative 45 in this case. I get negative 1215. So notice every value got multiplied by three, not just one row. And so what happens is you apply the rule about the one row three different times. So three different times you multiply by three, hence the new determinant is three cubed times the original determinant. Another important determinant rule is about the determinant of triangular matrices. A triangular matrix has zeros on one half of the diagonal. So for example, if I had this four by four in which the diagonal contains three, eight, negative four, and two, the determinant is the product of those values on the diagonal. And it doesn't matter if the top half or the bottom half are zeros. Here's an example of a three by three with diagonal four, six, nine, and the determinant turns out to be 216 because it's the product of the four times six times the nine. It turns out if you do that process of picking a number and then making the cofactors, like so finding the determinant of the three by three that remains behind, or with our three by three example, you pick the four and then find the determinant of the two by two that, fall, that stays behind, the zeros end up knocking out a, you know, a bunch of calculations. And so you'll end up just with the product of the numbers down the diagonal. Not too surprising if you find the transpose of a matrix, that is your rows become your columns and vice versa, you do not change the value of the determinant. The determinant stays the same. 
And earlier we had said you could calculate a determinant using the cofactor method going across a row or down a column. So again, you know, understanding that it makes sense that the determinant stays the same. Now if you multiply two matrices, they both need to be square. And when you multiply them, you will get a new matrix and the determinant of that matrix is equal to the product of the original determinants. So using one of our triangular matrices, the determinant was 216, 4 times 6 times 9, and then multiplying that by the negative 1, 0, 4, 1, 6, 7, that, that matrix which we know had a determinant of negative 45, we get the product negative 9,720. If you do try to find the determinant of their product, you'll see you still get negative 9,720. Now, if you happen to get a determinant of zero, that actually says something important about the matrix. It is singular. Remember the word singular means that it does not have an inverse. If the determinant is not zero, then the matrix has an inverse. So zero indicates that a matrix does not have an inverse. A determinant that is not zero indicates that a matrix does have an inverse. And then all kinds of other things are true about the matrix. If, if the inverse exists, we know it REFs to the identity matrix. Um, we know it has rank equal to N, you know, whatever the size of the matrix is. Um, we know that you can arrive at the identity matrix by multiplying by its inverse. And we know that it spans all of Rn. So every system of equations that you set up with it um, is going to give you a solution. We know that the null space only contains the zero vector, etc. There's that whole list of things that are kind of synonymous if you know that a matrix has an inverse that exists. So the determinant is an important calculation in terms of quickly figuring out a lot about what a matrix spans and what kind of solutions you get. So again, if the determinant is zero, no inverse exists. If the determinant is not zero, an inverse does exist and that whole list of important things are true about the matrix. So again, here is that list that we had looked at, you know, earlier in the chapter. So if you know that A is invertible, meaning it has an inverse, then you know it's row equivalent to the identity matrix. If you RREF it, you will get the identity matrix. Thus, it has N pivot columns. If you set up the solution A times any vector equals zero, that system set equal to zero only has the trivial solution. The trivial solution is the zero vector. So only the zero vector gives you zero. Um, you know that the columns are linearly independent. You know that any transformation formed with it has an inverse transformation that will undo it. Any equation that you set up with that matrix will have exactly one solution in Rn. The columns span all of Rn, so the rank of the matrix is N because it spans all of Rn. And if you have a linear transformation, it is going to map vectors in Rn onto vectors in Rn. It's an onto transformation and it's a one-to-one -one transformation. And I guess that pretty much lists everything. We've mentioned that the null space only contains the zero vector. So again, there's this whole list of things that are true if your matrix has a determinant that is not zero. So again, if the determinant is not zero, you know an inverse exists and all of these other things hold true. One last thing to mention is that inverse matrices have reciprocal determinants. So if a matrix has an inverse, 
the determinant of that inverse is the reciprocal. So one of our examples, the determinant was negative 45. The inverse of that matrix is shown. The determinant of the inverse is negative 1 over 45. Again, that's a useful you know, thing to have in our toolbox as we work with systems of equations and matrices. Well, that pretty much sums up all of the important details about determinants. We went over the definition. Again, the original definition is pretty convoluted, but if you look at some patterns of actually calculating them by hand, you can kind of see the logic behind the definition. For the most part, we will let calculators do all that grunt work for us, but it's important to understand what goes into the calculation. And then once again, if a determinant is not zero, then that whole list of important details are true about your matrix. Mm -hmm.